to today take a look at the uh, the pitch and uh, Q and A. And uh, we talked a little bit about the the, the pitch yesterday, and you, you clearly have a lot of different directions that you could take with this. And uh, you know, deciding whether you're going to connect your pitch directly to the the project that you've been working on, or whether you're going to pitch something other than a street map. Um, you might go back and consider a, a GIS from your state of the art review. You might pitch an algorithm. Um, think about how, how big you want to dream. Do you want to go in an entirely new direction? So these are really decisions that your team can make. So it's a lot of, a lot of latitude here. And as you do build your pitch, we want you to keep in mind that you're going to want to be able to tell us what's already out there and where there's some kind of a hole, some kind of a gap that you're gonna fill. So kind of a standard research uh, development. And here's an example from a couple of years ago. Uh, and I think this was actually the opening slide for the presentation. Um, but they were directly kind of engaging what they were then going to continue in their pitch. And this could be something that you might consider as a team, what you begin the presentation with, you then pick up in the pitch. Here, the team was focusing on uh, uh, TTC accessibility. And so planning trips for people with disabilities. And here you can see in this opening slide, it uh, kind of establishes the problem. Uh, kind of with this uh, dramatic visual. And then once they got into the pitch, um, they focused first on kind of what's out there, what real, what real trans offers through TTC. This kind of uh, somewhat uh, complicated process, but they, they show it to us in very kind of uh, concrete terms. And then the next slide shows what they, trip planner would, would bring to the plan. So simplifying it uh, to this uh, kind of four-step process. And I think the team included a couple of additional slides, but not much more. And so, um, you know, one thing you might want to pay attention to here is that you don't have much time with the pitch. And so you want your slides to be, uh, be effective, but 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 be very, I guess, selective in in um, in designing a few slides that will give you kind of maximum uh, output. Um, here's a few past uh, past pitches. Uh, uh, a few years ago, pizza delivery was was popular for some reason, and maybe always popular. And um, uh, GIS and public health. Uh, we've got lots of interest now in, uh, of course, in the pandemic and coronavirus. There's always uh, been interest in in public health uh, in 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 the GIS field. Uh, there was a past uh, uh, pitch on on a wind energy project that used uh, used GIS. Uh, again, kind of a medical, uh, medical based uh, 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 pitch looking at uh, sickle cell disease and tracking environmental factors connected with that. Um, one pitch that looked at uh, the oil pipeline system, uh, particularly is here looking at the, the United States. So lots of, as you know, lots of different directions that you could take here. Um, and one finally that I that I wanted to include uh, GIS for refugee camps. Uh, certainly, a few years ago, there was a pretty substantial crisis, particularly in in the Middle East and Syria, with refugee camps. And so there was a lot of attention that went into uh, what GIS could do to solve some of the problems in, in refugee camps. So here, if you were going to take this as your, your an idea for a pitch, something you were interested in pursuing, what kind of research might you be wanting to conduct here? So I just did a, a quick search. This was a, a, a couple of years ago I did this and uh, uh, 
kind of updated it more recently. And um, many of you have probably looked at the GIS lounge in, in some of your research for the state of the art review and looking at here at how spatial modeling can help the help with refugee aid and sort of establishes here this, this problem with a kind of crisis with, with, with refugees in the Middle East and Europe and some of the, uh, the, the kind of here, the spatial algorithm approaches that are looking at geographic, social, infrastructural risk factors, different kinds of analysis, and then other methods that are being used um, to, to deal with uh, kind of uh, gathering information about how crowds move and uh, the aid that is available to them. And uh, in that same, uh, that same article, it presented a graphic on uh, some of the challenges with uh, food distribution in, uh, in a refugee camp in the South Sudan. And so I was kind of interested in, in that. And I saw that, uh, that there was a, a source that, uh, that the article had, had referred to here to uh, draw up this, uh, this figure. And so I went to the list of references and found the source, went to it. So sort of my next step with the research, just follow the, follow the research chain here a little bit. And here using GIS as a planning coordination tool, refugee camps in South Sudan. And uh, quick read, uh, you know, uh, initially the, the, uh, the article here, it, it establishes the situation that with natural disasters, timely information is, is critical. Uh, the problem is that recent crises have exposed shortcomings in rapidly gathering and effectively using the information. And it pointed to two specific gaps one with the, the emergency phase of a crisis and the second with the recovery and development phase. And then presented a, uh, a solution, the, the present solution, uh, this organization uh, REACH, which is an initiative of two NGOs and a, a UN program. And REACH kind of develops information tools to aid in humanitarian causes and crises. And, uh, and then the article went on to uh, highlight a, uh, a figure here on showing how uh, REACH is using GIS-based data to deal with the, the, the planning and coordination uh, in these refugee camps in the South Sudan. And as I looked at this, I thought, you know, this figure would probably need to be simplified in a pitch if you were going to use it. Probably a little too complicated for, for your purposes. But as you research, you're going to find this kind of, this kind of material. And, and then I was thinking, well, is this enough research? Have you done enough now to go in and give your pitch? And I was thinking you would probably want to look for more, for more current research. Uh, I did a quick look at what... Um, at what ESRI uh, uh, is, 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 is uh, doing now. Many of you have, have looked at, at ESRI at ARC uh, uh, to get some ideas for, for GIS. And, and they're kind of right in the middle of all of this. So you might be able to find something that's, that, that's currently happening. And then for your pitch, figuring out then what could you add to the solution? Here's what's kind of existing now. What can you, what can you add to it? And that's probably uh, about as, as far as you need to, to really be, be, uh, be going with, with, uh, with the pitch. And then finally, just very quickly, you get to the takeaway. And um, you know, what, what is it that you want us to remember? Um, are you going to go back to maybe an opening point? Are you gonna go back to something in the pitch to a key innovation? Um, you know, the, 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 the made to stick sort of mantra that tell me three things, I remember nothing. So keeping to a, a focused point is probably, probably your goal here, but lots of different ways that you could consider developing that point. So going to the to Q and A, um, just a couple of suggestions. Uh, 
you know, don't, don't bury the lead. Try to give a concise, direct answer first. Sometimes you may find it's kind of a closed question and a, a yes or a no or a number may, may be sufficient. Or, you know, give that concise answer and then give detail. And, and if you're unsure um, about whether, uh, unsure about how to an answer the question, or if you've provided enough detail, it, it's certainly fine to ask, you know, is that enough detail? Is that, uh, is that sufficient? And then sometimes you'll get, uh, you know, an affirmative uh, nod from, from either your TA or your CI, whoever's asked the question. So this is it's certainly fair to do. And if you feel that you're, you're not sure what direction to take with the question, it's, it, it's okay to, 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 to rephrase it. You know, I think you're asking if, and a dot 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 and, and, and is that right and um you know often uh, 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 the the person asking the question won't completely rephrase the question for you but um would would maybe give you the affirmative that yes this is this is what i'm asking uh or no that's not what i'm asking so you could get some uh some clarification that's certainly um that's certainly fair in this in this uh, setting, and and then finally, just a note to project your voice with confidence. Uh, be be try to be a confident speaker. It will make the um, information that you present that much more um, convincing, uh, most likely. And uh, I thought I'd just take a moment on this on this point of projecting with confidence to, to look at a, sh a short part of a video that's, uh, it, it's kind of funny, I think, but it, it, it kind of makes this, uh, this point uh, about the value of, the value of delivering with confidence. Hear that? That's nothing. Which is what I, as a speaker at today's conference, have for you all. I have nothing. Nada. Zip. Zilch. Zippo. Nothing smart. Nothing inspirational. Nothing even remotely researched at all. I have absolutely nothing to say whatsoever. And yet, through my manner of speaking, I will make it seem like I do. <laughs> like what I am saying is brilliant. And maybe, just maybe, you will feel like you've learned something. Now, I'm going to get started with the opening. I'm going to make a lot of hand gestures. I'm going to do this with my right hand. I'm going to do this with my left. I I'm going to adjust my glasses. And then I'm going to ask you all a question. Uh, by show of hands, how many of you all have been asked a question before? OK, great, I'm seeing some hands. And again, I have nothing here. <laughs> now, I'm going to react to that and act like I'm telling you a personal anecdote. Something to break the tension. Something to endear myself a little bit. <laughs> something kind of uh, embarrassing. <laughs> and you guys are going to make an awe sound. Aww. It's true. It really happened. <laughs> and now I'm going to bring it to a broader point. I'm going to reel you back in. I'm going to make it intellectual. I'm going to bring it to this man right here. Now, what this man did was important, I'm sure. <laughs> but I, for one, have no idea who he is. I simply Google image the word scientist. <laughs> and now, you see, I'd like it to seem like I'm making points, building an argument, inspiring you to change your life, when in reality, this is just me buying Time. Now, if you don't believe me, let's take a look at the numbers. This is a real thing that's happening right now. <laughs> the number of talks that I'm giving is one. <laughs> Interesting facts imparted thus far in said talk, well, that's going to be a zero. <laughs> My height in inches is 70.5. Note the 0.5 there. 
2 times 6 equals 12, and then interestingly enough, 6 times 2 also equals 12. That's okay. I think you, you get the idea here, right? And uh, it, it's, uh, it, it's kind of surprising uh, how long he's able to keep our interest, right? And not that you should rely upon this as you uh, approach your, your, your presentations, but it, it gives you uh, some, some sense of the, the power of projection, the power of uh, speaking with some confidence. And so, um, so you may want to uh, uh, review that at some point just for fun. And uh, so what I want to do is go to um, a short uh, breakout room exercise here. And uh, I'll post this slide in the chat. So when you go into the breakout room, you can refer to it. And I want you to choose one member of your group who will answer the, answer the question. And the question is, explain simulated annealing to your CI. And uh, the speaker will have one minute to answer. And then the listening members will provide feedback for about one minute in total. And you can respond to, you know, was the answer clear? Was it appropriate to a non-specialist audience? Uh, did the speaker use effective vocal projection and intonation? Uh, were there a minimal number of filler words? So these could be some of the things that you could focus on in giving some feedback. So I will go to that now. And first I will put into the chat the slide. Ken, I can see a question from Trevor that's maybe a good one for both this and OP2. He's asking if he can screen share and annotate. Uh, so could he screen share a whiteboard? <clears throat> oh, during the, uh, the breakout. I'm guessing that's a question both for the breakout and for OP2. Yeah, well, for, for, for OP2, certainly, certainly annotating, yeah. And certainly you could, you could choose to, to share a, 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 a whiteboard. And, and annotate. That's that's definitely open for for OP two. Um, for the breakout here, if you if you I, I haven't uh, enabled some of those features yet. Um, so maybe for the breakout, we can just try to keep it to uh, uh, this kind of uh, have the speaker answer question and then some feedback. Um, but uh, but if you want to try to use to do some annotation, uh, perhaps that would be would be fine as well. Um, don't know I answered that so well, but uh, anyways, let me get to the breakout rooms. How many we've got? We've got fifty people, so maybe I'll make seventeen. Okay, so I will open these breakout rooms now. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Hello. Hey, Jay. Hello. Hi, everyone. I think one of you should take a shot at explaining this because I already gave it my best shot during lecture. <laughs> <laughs> so you can tell me how I did in the course evaluations. <laughs> uh, yeah, does Iwan want to do it? Or? It's kind of distressing. <laughs> we haven't, um, our team hasn't really started on simulator annealing yet. So. So the idea of this question is, uh, and you could get questions like this in the final presentation, is, is describe something from the lectures. So you don't need to know it in any more detail than, than we talked about in lecture. Uh, and so in one minute or less, what is simulated annealing? Why might you use it? Yeah, right, sure. So simulated annealing, can I just start explaining? <laughs> Do you mind? Um, okay, all right. So simulated annealing is a technique you can use 
um, to solve the traveling salesman problem, which is sort of like a meta structure on top of all the algorithms that you might use, um, for example, greedy and chaos improvements. So the idea is that you can think of the analogy with like annealing a piece of metal and whereby the temperature is cooled down from uh, with a sort of exponential function so that at the starts, you can have a lot of uh, kinetic energy perturbations. So with your K-Ops, you might do uh, like three or four uh, swaps instead of two and then after some time, as you get closer and closer to your time limit, it'll start, it'll be less likely to accept bigger perturbations. Is that all right? <laughs> uh, sounds good. Uh, how, 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 uh, sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name, but uh, how Chang, why don't you uh, go ahead and give your analysis? Oh, uh, we want have 40 seconds now, so I guess I'll do it in 20 seconds. So basically, uh, simul simulated annealing is just um, you have to connect some dots on the graph. And then uh, the longer you spend time connecting those dots, uh, you, can, you can have many, many ways to connect those dots. But the longer you spend connecting those dots, the less changes you make to the graph that you already connected. So let's say uh, you want to change everything, then that's at the beginning. And then the longer you want to change the the ways you connect the dot, then it will that you will only change like one or two connections. Okay, it looks like everybody is back. I think with us. Um, <clears throat> I'm just kind of uh, curious what uh, what your takeaway from this exercise would be uh, in terms of preparing for uh, OP2 Q&A. Anything that you learned that you might want to take with you? Try to say less ums, okay. See the TA with questions, so you are prepared for certain questions, okay. Is it much harder to explain simulated? It's much harder than to explain you thought, okay, good. Uh, curse of knowledge, that's right. Uh, these things you know that that your audience may not. And um, maybe you realize that maybe you didn't know uh, a lot about simulated annealing, or even if you did, that it was more difficult to explain than you thought. Okay, use the ball rolling down the hill analogy. Okay, good. Try to. Uh, uh, Try to draw on analogy where 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 uh, possible. So so good. Yeah, this is uh, the kind of question that that might well come up in 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 OP two. So um, so good. So hopefully it uh, gave you something to think about. Uh, so Vaughn, I'll pass it over to you now, and you can uh, you can wrap up. I can see the slide, Vaughn, but I, I can't hear you yet. Maybe you're not speaking yet. I can't hear you. Okay, can you hear me now, Ken? Yeah, gotcha. Okay, great, thanks. Okay, so I'm gonna talk uh, quickly about pitching an idea, which Dr. Tallman's already gone over, but I'll try to convey a little bit more information, uh, hopefully that a few things he hasn't hit already. Uh, okay, so your your pitch is basically modeled after something that you'll do a lot in your career, more than you think, uh, which is you're trying to sell an idea. So you do that when you're doing things like starting a new business, trying to get your company to, uh, or your university to undertake a new project. So a lot of engineers uh, are kind of uncomfortable with this idea at first. I think engineers design things, they make things, they don't sell things, okay? Uh, but you do. So you do pitch ideas 
you know, you don't try to be probably like this guy, right? Who looks a little bit like a used car salesman, uh, but with appropriate evidence, argument, data, you do have to sell your ideas. Okay, when might you do that? Well, starting a company. Uh, so some of you will probably start a company at some point in your career. So one of the things you need is funding. You want funding, you have to convince people, why should you give me some money? Getting customers. So is this a good project? Got to pitch them on that. Hiring employees. So you're, whenever you're hiring someone, you're, you're basically trying to convince them this is a good place to be. So that's a form of pitch as well. If, even if you don't start a company, you will still pitch a lot. So as I said, uh, you, if you're inside a larger company or in a university, you have an idea, you want to make something better, you've got to convince your boss or perhaps many bosses to spend the company or the university's money and resources on it. So that's a pitch. Uh, even when you're a brand new engineer on a team, you make smaller pitches. You might have an idea for a way that the, you or the team could do something better. Well, that you got to sell that idea. Okay. Yeah, you might have to convince her the team should do this. Maybe we should put this in the company's project products, but you can't do it all by yourself or you, you can't do it without taking some of your work time. You got to sell the idea. Okay. Okay. So, uh, Part of your presentation, the bulk of it, is you're talking about what you've done in this project. So, and that's actually links into all real pitches. So team quality matters a lot. Uh, is this team credible? Are they skilled? You're not gonna really address that in your pitch. It's basically gonna transfer over from the first part of your presentation. And there's a, a truism in uh, venture capital that a great team with a mediocre idea is better than a mediocre team with a great idea because basically your idea is going to change. Most projects, most companies, etc., they change their their vision and their mandate of what they're going to do. But a great team can can do that. Okay, so you'd really much rather have you know this this uh, the, the Maple Leafs uh, than than some Pee Wee League. And maybe you can even, I'm a Montreal Canadiens fan, maybe you can even get the Montreal Canadiens. Convince them you're not that strong a team. Okay, so you're not gonna explicitly do that in your pitch, uh, except that's one way you might link your pitch to the rest of the presentation. You say, now that you've seen that we've been able to do this, I wanna talk to you about an exciting opportunity. Uh, and everything you've done up to that point helps build your credibility. Have you brought energy, clarity, answer questions well, uh, your achievements seem impressive. Okay. Um, and in the real world, uh, within a company, starting a company, whatever, pitches always have an in-person meeting because you want to see the team. You want to see, do they bring that energy? Do they bring, give you that sense of confidence or not? So try to bring that to your presentation, instill that confidence. Okay. So let's talk a bit more about the pitch itself. So the first part of the pitch is what is the problem? So as Dr. Tallman said, what's the situation? What's the problem? So find a gap, okay? Uh, and a team of entrepreneurs that I was fortunate to work with uh, in the hatchery, so that's U of T's uh, engineering incubator for entrepreneurs, was named Fuelware. So these were two undergraduate engineers uh, that I worked with over a summer. And they had an idea to make heated clothing, electrically heated clothing. So the first thing they had, that was their idea. They're actually kind of technology driven. They really wanted to make clothes and an embedded wiring and a battery system and it would keep you warm. So they had to figure out, well, who, who needs this? Okay, so who are your users? What's the value? Uh, what is the gap? And they went through a few iterations of this. They thought maybe it was contractors and they figured out actually con it didn't fit contractors well for a few different way reasons, like people outside fixing hydro poles and so on. It wasn't a good fit. What it was a good fit to were, were skiers. Uh, skiers ski down a mountain, they get hot, they ride up a chairlift, they get cold. So if you had some clothing that could heat you up when you're cold, but not when you're getting warm coming down the mountain, that could be good. Okay, so now they've gone from technology to a target market. Uh, they need to survey the landscape. So it's not enough to say, hey, we could build this and maybe skiers would like this. You got to see, well, is there already a product like that? Are we, uh, is there really a gap? So they did that survey and actually found there is a competitor. It's a company called Venture Heat. And they actually made electrically heated clothing for sports. So not so good, right? They don't have a gap anymore. So they had to see, they could give up. They could just say, no gap, let's try something different. But they uh, didn't want to give up. They liked this technology. So they looked at, well, what could we do that's different? And what they found is a couple things. Venture Heat, you just turned a button on or you, you turned a dial and it turned, out, turned on a certain amount of electric current, which produced a certain amount of heat. But this does not match skiers very well. 
okay? You cool off, you heat up as you're going up and down the chairlift or skiing down the mountain. Uh, it would be nicer if that was automatic. So they built feedback controlled uh, heating. So it would automatically adapt to your body temperature and the outside temperature. Another thing that was interesting is this is not washable. It's got wires in it, but it is a base layer. You sweat in it. So they worked really hard to figure out how could they make theirs washable despite it having wiring and electronics in it. Those were the differentiators. Okay, so they found the gap, they figured out, they surveyed the landscape, confirmed there really is a gap. How are they gonna address it? So what's your solution? We don't need too many details, but we need to know the big picture. Uh, and ideally, you know, it's got some novelty because that's gonna help uh, differentiate you. So their novelty was basically putting this whole system together. Uh, they, they had this good feedback control, so it heats up, cools down automatically. They had washable wiring, which turned out to be actually quite hard. Most wiring, if you wash it uh, a few times, is destroyed. So I had to research all sorts of materials. Um, they, when they pitched, they didn't have every problem solved. That's better to just admit. These are our key challenges. How are we going to make this washable wiring work well? We're working on it. Um, we're going to solve it. Much better for you to state this is a key challenge than for your audience to go, seems like there's a big challenge here, which they haven't even said that they understand is a big challenge. Don't have to have it all solved. Better to say that you know it's a challenge though. And make it memorable, okay? So you, you can't fund or buy or support what you can't remember. So make the pitch memorable and that'll be part of your grade. And the fuel roll group that I, I, I just mentioned, uh, that project went really well. They made a memorable pitch. They did a great job prototyping. They raised over $100,000 in a uh, GoFundMe campaign and, and they won the prize of a uh, $25,000 lack of air prize. So that was a really successful one. Okay. So, uh, Ken, if anything really interesting comes up in the chat, let me know, uh, since I can't actually see it right now. Um, okay, so that's kind of how you craft your pitch in one example. What, what could you propose? So Dr. Tallman talks some about this. Let me give you a few more uh, thoughts. Um, so one obvious one is visualization. You could visualize more data. You could have target specific users. So this is a GIS, for example, that maps crime risk. Uh, you know, in your pitch, one of the things you might want to uh, address is this has uh, utility for some users, but could also stigmatize certain communities. So if you went for something like this, probably want to actually talk about that. Is that going to be okay or not? Um, you can go beyond visualization, though. So you can incorporate things like modeling. This is a GIS that is created by a company called Blue Dot here in Toronto. And what this GIS does is it doesn't just visualize data, it also does modeling to predict what's going to happen. And, and this was developed well before COVID-19. So what I'm showing here are airline routes. Okay, so this is a map of air routes through the world. And they use this plus data on emerging epidemics to predict where are they gonna go and what public health measures should be put in place. So you might have uh, an epidemic that is breaking out somewhere in the world that is heavily connected to say London, England by air routes. And even though it hasn't gotten to London yet, you say uh, we need to throttle air traffic or we need to take controls at the airport. That same company, Blue Dot, goes beyond uh, modeling in another way with optimization. So in the 2014 Ebola epidemic in West Africa, they use their software, which actually is built on top of OpenStreetMap data, so the same open source database that you're using, to actually model where should they put uh, Ebola treatment centers so that they could minimize the, both the worst case and the average travel time uh, of the communities uh, throughout, throughout the country. Okay, um, so basically you can think about that of how to go beyond just visualizing more data. How can you bring in your modeling, your optimization expertise? Uh, so what I haven't really, neither Dr. Tallman nor I have told you exactly what the pitch and some, some teams have been asking, you know, what, what ideas could they have? Um, so we're not going to really give you any super specific ideas. We want you to come up with your own, but it's good to read about technology. That's one of the ways you get ideas. You see, what are the big trends? And that's often where you want to pitch both in this course, but especially if you're driving a project in a business or a startup. Uh, so some of the big trends are software is, is really changing the world. A lot of things that were done manually are moving to software automation. So that's a mega trend. Uh, there are more and more sensors, more and more data. Uh, so that's changing the world. And you can go look at, for example, the 
um, smart vehicle technology center at U of T to see how they're using that to optimize traffic and other things. Software is being used to optimize all sorts of stuff. Uh, an interesting article is on Amazon warehouses. So how are they using robotics? How are they using um, planning of routes of people picking up and robots picking up items in their warehouses and organizing their warehouses to solve something that's kind of like your traveling courier problem. Machine learning, so self-driving cars, uh, virtual reality and augmented reality. So Pokemon Go is kind of a, a very unique GIS, you know, overlaying a video game on top of a real map uh, of the world. So these are just some of the things that you might go and read about um, and give you ideas. And brainstorm. Okay, so it's like APS 111, 112. Uh, brainstorm a problem, outline a possible solution, create lots of ideas, and then pick your favorites and refine. And it's pretty open ended because we're saying you get to identify both the problem and the possible solution. So there's a lot of different ways you could go. Okay, so I'm going to do a sample pitch. Dr. Tallman and I, our team, is going to pitch this and you're going to critique how we did. Okay, so a few years ago, I was fortunate to be able to present at a conference in Xi'an, China. And Xi'an, China is the former historic capital of China uh, around a millennia ago. And the first emperor who unified China, uh, that was his capital. And it's famous for the terracotta warriors. So thousands of terracotta warriors that were his uh, burial tomb. Uh, so that was really exciting. So I went to see that and it was great. Um, but was, what was not so great was the air pollution. So this is a picture from Xi'an and you can see it looks foggy, but it's not, that's all smog. There was a beautiful mountain right near the terracotta warriors that you can climb and go see the view from it, except we could barely from 50 meters away even see the start of the mountains. There was really no point in climbing it. So that has a big impact on your, on your quality of life. Uh, and there are some there's some software that sprung up to to help people with that. So this is a, a GIS that exists today that's showing particulate counts in various parts of the world. So this is showing it in Xi'an and you can see these red ones are, are not good. Uh, those are high particulate counts, not good for you. But we'd like to go further. It's not enough to just know that we have high particulate counts and we shouldn't go outside. We want to know why. We have these high particulate counts. We want to change it. We want to make um, cities like Qi'an and all around the world safer for people to, to live in. Uh, and you could see some of the sources. This is a coal generation plant. And you can see it spewing out particulates. Uh, but we need to make a link here of we want to go and protest. We don't want to protest in general about, against air pollution. We want to protest against the specific polluters causing this problem. So how are we going to do that? Well through a lot of uh, software engineering and research. We're going to estimate the pollution volume from various sources, and we're going to analyze public emissions databases. We're going to take photographs that experts have analyzed. And in the long term, we're going to train a machine learning algorithm to correlate the photographic output to pollution output. So that's one of the key components. From that estimate of where is the pollution produced, we need to estimate where does it go? What's the drift? How is it spreading? And we can solve this with compute power because weather prediction does a very similar problem. It's compute intensive, but you solve the partial differential equations that govern wind motion and particle motion, and you will see where it goes. We've got to make sure we're accurate. So we're going to correlate it to measured pollution. There are already hundreds of sensors on the internet. We're going to make sure that we match their measured data. We will keep fine tuning, keep refining one and two until we get there. And then we're going to visualize the results on our GIS, and that's going to lead to targeted pressure and cleaner air. All right, so how do we do? So why don't you type it in the chat or, uh, or just unmute yourself. What do you think of our pitch? What was good? What was bad? You're not going to hurt our feelings uh, because we, we, didn't, we don't think it's perfect either, okay? So... <laughs> Okay, so Svenny, you're saying the slides could have been better. So that, I agree. What, what would you change? Yeah, too much text. So let's see, Wei Hang said you showed real pictures so you can connect to the problem. Um, and I agree, okay, so I like this part. 
pictures. People said they liked the story, gave a personal connection. So yeah, I think here, I personally like this part as well. Ken, what do you think? Do you like the story at the start? Yeah, I thought the story at the great is great at the beginning, and yeah. uh, and then the map that you show after with okay. the different uh, particular count, uh, very helpful. It's, it's 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 simple, makes the point. As we get into that last slide, we start to lose our attention and focus, right? Right. And, so there's the feedback. The heavy text the is kind of overwhelming. Yeah, so there's the feedback from some of the students, there's too much text. And I think that's probably about this slide. And Ken, you're saying, yeah, I mean, I know you didn't like the slide. I said, we got to get across the technical detail. So sounds like you were right, right? Too, too wordy. We should have gone with pictures. Uh, and, and maybe we needed to, uh, to simplify this too. Maybe it was just too much. What do you think? Yeah, yeah find a way to find a way to simplify it. Um, yeah. Perhaps into break it into a couple of slides. Maybe there's too much there for a single slide. Uh, Partial uh, differential equation is curse of knowledge. Maybe. So yeah, so I agree. I mean, so I what what Dr. Tall and I actually did is we kind of tried hard, uh, but maybe not perfectly, on the first few slides. And this one, you know, we kind of we're running out of time and we wanted to. We didn't do the best job. I think this would be better as some kind of flow chart simplify it too much text totally agree um i think it would actually personally be bad to totally eliminate this the reason it, but we should simplify the reason that it would be bad if we completely eliminated it is people might not have any idea of well what are we actually going to do um because we said we should we should have a gis that somehow lets people know who caused the pollution so they can protest it um, we don't have to say exactly all the details of how we're going to do that because it can, you know, this could be years of work actually. So we may not know all the details, but if we have no idea of how we're even going to start or what, or that this is a hard problem, it might not inspire confidence. So don't get bogged down in exactly how you're going to do it, but also don't neglect. There's a hard part here of how do we figure out where the pollution came from. And if we don't say anything uh, that that's hard, we're going to research it. That might not be good. Uh, okay. But I think it's general. Yeah, and, and, and Sana, Sana has a good point at the end uh, to, to, to split the split up the slide into four slides. What, one thing though is to keep in mind is you don't have very much time for this pitch. In the overall presentation that's 13 to 17 minutes, you've got maybe maybe five minutes, right? To, to really work this through. So um, be selective in the points that you want to make and how you're going to build it. And, uh, you know, leave your audience with enough confidence that, that you know there's some challenges ahead, but you're going to, you know what those are and how you would work on them. Yeah, good points. So I put a fair, I put probably, well, definitely should have pictures here. And it's probably too much because as Dr. Tallman said, if we spread this out and take longer on it, we've lost time to actually say, why are we doing it? And that's probably not a good trade-off. Okay, um, so thanks. Those are all good points. So in the last few moments, we don't have many, I was gonna give a few examples uh, from you know things that I've been involved with in my career that kind of highlight stickiness for me. So I like to think about how do you make ideas stick? Uh, I believe in, in the made to stick principles. Okay, so, uh, this is actually that company Blue Dot that I talked about uh, that it studies infectious diseases and uh, makes GISs. This is how a, a way for them to introduce uh, a crisis that they're working on. So I was actually at a conference where Blue Dot presented and let me walk through a couple of different openings. So Blue Dot is making GISs to predict and mitigate the impact of infectious disease. And there has been an Ebola outbreak in West Africa, over 11,000 deaths, according to the Centers for Disease Control. The mortality rate is appalling, 74%. This is a true crisis. And Blue Dot software is being used to help plan the response. What do you think of this? Okay, what do you think this is my, as my opening if I was Blue Dot? So if you got any ideas, just type it in the chat. Say best ever. And in particular, I'm kind of thinking about this in the terms of the made to stick principles. Okay, so people are saying kind of boring, a bit bland. Uh, okay, so you're not too inspired by this. Not glamorous, but okay. You know, uh, surprising, jarring, 
Okay, so people think, you know, it's not terrible, but it's not fantastic. In terms of made to stick, I would say this is, you know, maybe it's simple. There's not too many words. Uh, it's probably credible. There's some statistics there and the sensors for disease control are look credible. Um, okay, let me go on to how, this is not actually how uh, Dr. Khan introduced Blue Dot. The next slide is how he introduced it. Yeah, and Ken says no story. So there is a crisis in West Africa. This is a cemetery and you can see a child's grave, a grieving mother and a medical worker who's so overwhelmed that she has gone to the graveyard still in full protective gear. Uh, it is a grave situation and we want to help. Okay, so that was the real opening that Dr. Khan did. What do you think of that one? <clears throat> Yeah, so I see everybody going emotion, right? And you're right, it is emotion. It's memorable. No concrete data, that's true, okay? So actually a good follow-up would be to say, give the number, right? So there, and I believe he actually did do that. Uh, so we have over 11,000 dead. Um, uh, and I can't remember his exact choice of words. So he might not have said grave situation. So. I, I was at the conference where he presented this and you could have heard a pin drop. It's one of the most memorable openings I've ever seen to a talk, right? He had everyone, uh, everyone's attention because it was very concrete. You felt it and it was very emotional. And he did follow up with, you know, uh, one or two statistics, you know, just what's happening, the mortality rate, but it, it has much more impact than just putting a few numbers on a slide to start with something like this. Okay. So, this is a student, real student email I got from 2015. Okay, so I was shocked and appalled to learn. So I, when I'm reading this, I'm like, whoa, we've got a big problem here. Uh, that I cannot form a team with my friends in another time slot. Can I? Okay, so this is a person also using emotion, uh, but it's not good. Okay, so it, it caught my attention. It is memorable because I'm telling you about this six years later, uh, but it appears manipulative and inappropriate. So I know in APS 111, 112, well, I believe this is still the case, you're kind of taught to avoid emotion. So you don't want to have emotional appeals that are you know, kind of inappropriate, just feels manipulative. Um, but you want to use emotion to make people remember you, but in a good way. So this would be a bad way. Person is kind of overreacting, it's not appropriate, okay? Uh, this is, uh, yeah, so is it or they were not, that student was not allowed to form friends with uh, his teams in another time slot. <laughs> So this was not a successful strategy. Okay, when you're a professor, you participate in research grants and universities participate in them. So there was a really big research program called the Canada First Research Excellence Fund. And they gave out huge grants, but only a few. Okay, so in this particular round of research, they're only gonna give out three in the country, but they were big. And U of T, Medicine and biomedical engineering were to combine and ask for $150 million, which was almost half the available budget for the whole country. So it's pretty audacious. This has to be sticky, okay? Um, because the reviewers, there are all sorts of reviewers. Um, they are technical mostly, but even technical reviewers, they don't, they get a whole bunch of these proposals. And if they don't stick in their minds, uh, they're not going to fund them. And ultimately, this level of funding is also signed off by uh, a minister in the government. So it's got to stick with him or her as well. Okay, so what are we going to call it? So they wanted to basically combine biomedical engineering and medicine. So potential title is designing molecules, cells, tissues, and organs to treat degenerative disease. What do you think of this as a title? Yeah, it's, it's too long. It doesn't really tell you anything. But it, it's actually very common. Uh, this is like a pretty typical example of what you would name a research grant, okay? This is not what they used. Here's what they really used. The real name was Medicine by Design. So what do you think of that one? Okay, so some uh, Wei Heng thinks too generic, a little vague. Okay, Isidore likes it. Okay, so the, some difference of opinion. This is what they went with. They were successful. Okay, so this was a big success for U of T. They did actually take uh, almost half the budget for the whole country with this proposal. Uh, it's very memorable, okay, because the proposal then expands on what does that mean, right? Instead of kind of ad hoc management medicine, we're combining with engineers and together we're gonna design tissue, okay? So it was backed up with 
Yeah, so Ken, that's an interesting point. You said intriguing. It kind of creates a knowledge gap. It's short, it's simple. You don't quite know what it means. And it actually drew in, helped draw in the reviewers. Okay, so it was simple. Um, here's, read this quickly. Okay, so you need to have your kind of introductory sentence or paragraph to say, what are we trying to do? All right, these research grants are long. They start off with a summary. So why don't you just read this? Now, researchers at the center will focus on discovering new therapies based on the design and manufacture of molecules, cells, tissues, and organs that can be used safely and effectively to treat degenerative diseases, resolve the globally and commercially, and so on, okay? All right, so I see various people saying, I can't do it, it's hurting me. <laughs> uh, okay, so people are not loving it. Yeah, and I got bored reading it out loud too. This is really common though. This is a perfectly common summary at the start of a research uh, proposal, okay? Uh, so here's what they really went with. Imagine a world where a father need not choose which of his two children is saved by donating a kidney. Imagine a world where being born with cystic fibrosis is not a death sentence. Medicine by design will help bring about this world. Okay, so that is the method they went with. What kind of made to stick principles have they just used? Yeah, it's emotion. You can think about it. It's more concrete. It's not abstract things. It's helping a person. There's a story. It's not a story about a specific person. Now, this research grant was not one I was associated with. There was a follow-on research grant that electrical and computer engineering and computer science and various other factors were going for on big data and machine learning. And, and basically, for this last size of grant, the university brings in professional grant writers to coach you. And they kept going back to this one saying, you got to do it like this. Give me story, give me simple, too much data, too long. We didn't listen enough and our proposal was not successful, even though U of T is incredibly strong in those areas. Um, so it, you need these kinds of hooks, okay? And it's not just in your presentations. These are big competitive research grants and it's really important. And the university knows it enough to bring in professional coaches to try to get academics to do more of it. Um, okay, so uses more of those made to stick uh, principles. So story, concrete and emotional. Uh, okay, another truism of presenting is you need to adapt to your audience. So you have some information that you want to teach or convince someone of, and you have an audience that has certain knowledge and interests, you have to bridge that gap by adapting your message to, to meet the needs of your audience so they pay attention. Okay, what do you think? Now use any made to stick principles, does this have any value? Can you remember it? Was it memorable at all? Okay, zoned out, not particularly okay. People didn't like it too much, all right. Uh, all right, so I think it's actually not too bad. I mean, what do you think, Ken? Makes a valuable point. So yeah, this is, I think this is a valid point. It's visual, it's not too much text. Um, so I think it's not terrible. You know, it's maybe simple because we've got like just a simple graphic. Um, should be a Venn, yeah, Venn diagram might be better. Okay, let me show you another way to make this point. Okay, so Kevin Scahill is an, uh, an engineer, he's an engineering director at Cisco in Silicon Valley. I've known him for many, many years. Uh, in 1992, he was a new engineering grad uh, and so was I. Uh, and he decided to do something interesting. So he got his engineering degree. It was a strong job market, so he could go get a good uh, high paying job. But he did decided not to do that at first. He wanted to give back to his community. So he decided to teach math in inner city Los Angeles. He's American. Uh, and he found it very frustrating. He was trying to teach grade 12 students and they weren't really paying attention to him. They, they weren't getting the message he was, he was uh, giving. Uh, and he told the principal about this. He said, I'm, I'm teaching and they're not getting it and I'm very frustrated. And the principal said, if they're not learning, you're not teaching. And he said he really took that to heart, that he was teaching them the way that he liked to learn about math, not the way that he could engage them. It was not, it was his failure that they were not being engaged. He had to find a way to reach them. And once he came to that realization, he said it went much better, okay? He reached them, not all, not always, but he understood it was his role and he changed his approach and it worked much better. Okay, what do you think of this? It's essentially the same message, adapt to your audience, okay? Um, and I see Isidore saying it's a memorable story. 
I, I see other people say they didn't fall asleep. Okay, I'll, I'll take that. Uh, I found this very memorable because this is a real story. Kevin told this to me many years ago, and I still remember it. And I brought this story with me when I started teaching at U of T. Um, that, you know, I came to U of T to try to reach students. And if I wasn't reaching them, that was my problem. And I still remember this. Okay, so it's a story and people remember stories. Okay, I think it's the last one I have. So I think I'm a couple minutes over, but compute density. So uh, as electrical and computer engineers, we can be really proud of what we achieved in making computers better. So there have been, to make this concrete, there are huge improvements in computer size and performance over the last 40 years. In 1969, the Apollo computer, so state of the art going in a rocket ship, 61 centimeters by 32 centimeters by 17 centimeters in volume, weighed 32 kilograms and ran at the great speed of two megahertz. A modern microcontroller, two millimeters by 1.6 millimeters by 0.6 millimeters, it weighs grams and it runs at 48 megahertz. Okay, what do you think? Okay, so I see people saying better if you compared them with diagrams, I fell asleep, uh, no sense of scale, Trevor likes it, okay. Uh, I mean, there's some useful information on it. It's kind of a shocking statistic in a way. Uh, Ken, what do you think? Yeah, I think that the uh, the visual, the visualization is, is kind of essential here to uh, make this concrete. Yeah, it's, it's kind of concrete. It's got numbers on it. It's got too many numbers though. Like, why am I giving all the dimensions? Okay, I could just combine all these into volume, for example. Um, and instead of giving the, I could give ratios. Um, so it is concrete, but it's not simple and it's not very visual. It's actually, there's, a, there's an unexpected that's embedded in this, right? This is incredible changes, but I, I, the person's not kind of grasping it. So I kind of lost my chance for unexpected. Let me show you a better way to do this. I think it's better. This is the Apollo 1969 guidance computer. This is a freescale microcontroller. That is a dimple on a golf ball. It is 17 trillion times less volume and it's more performance. It's an incredible achievement for the industry. What do you think of that? Uh, how much more performance? Let's see, I have to go back and see. Okay, so um, it's 24 times higher clock frequency but it's actually going to get more work done per clock. So it's probably a few hundred times faster anyway. So what is the 1969? The 1969 computer is next to, I'm not actually sure. That may be the data entry system. That might be their keyboard that they use to communicate with it. Uh, but that thing's big. All right? It would actually be even better if we had some, a golf ball in that picture as well to give scale. Um, but you know that, that thing is the size of you know, a top of a desk, right? and weighs something like a hundred pounds. So. I also like the, the, the higher level statistics in this, this second slide. And it's one thing with the, the, the blue dot presentation, many of their slides so showed kind of high level statistics, not getting too granular, right? Once the statistics get, the numbers get too granular, we, we, we lose the main point, I think. So keeping the, the, the statistics at a high level makes good sense. Yeah. Uh, and Isidore's asking, when is this over? That was it. That was the last one, last neg to fill out the course evaluations. So that is it for our material. We'll stick around for any questions. Um, good luck in M4 and OP2. And thanks, everybody. Yeah. All the best. Yes, and any any questions that you've got, uh, we're we're here for you for for a, a bit. Yes, and fill out those course evaluations, uh, suggestions. So um, we 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 value your your comments uh, very highly. Yeah, thanks everybody. Thanks for all the uh, positive feedback in the chat too. So uh, I think we're both Dr. Tallman and I. This course is. It's kind of a labor of love. It's a lot of work, but uh, but it's also rewarding when, when we see students learning in it. <clears throat> yeah, and we, we've been very kind of uh, uh, very impressed by the, the engagement in the chat. For us, that's been a very uh, 
uh, kind of motivating factor, right? That when we see that you're engaged, it, it helps to keep us all engaged. So, so, so thank you for, for that. Yeah, we've been, uh, actually, we weren't sure how this was going to go online. Um, and, uh, you know, I've been really impressed with the resilience that the class has shown, right? So do you, class, despite being online, has actually produced excellent questions, you know, great solutions, uh, overcome lots of stuff. So it's been, it's been impressive. You guys had an extra challenging semester and have risen to it. So. Okay, if there are no more questions, I'm going to end it there. Uh, stop recording.